Welcome to the Java design patterns step-by-step -step video tutorial. What are design patterns? If I ask you a question, do you know how to read and write English? You are likely to say, yes, of course. But do you know how to read and write English equally well? For example, I can give you poems by Shelley and Byron and you can read them. But can you write poetry as well as them? Programming is very similar. When you learn a programming language, you only learn how to read other people's code, not to write them. Given a project, it is very difficult to come up with ideas about how to design your class files to look professional. So how do you learn to write programs? Design Patterns is the writer's workshop for programmers. This video will show you for a given problem how to design your classes. Now, there are many design patterns. In this video, I have chosen the 16 most popular design patterns. Every programmer should know design patterns. This is the material that will take you from being a junior developer to a senior developer. Hope you will find this video tutorial enjoyable. First, let us take a look at the singleton pattern. Now, what is a singleton pattern? If we want a class to have only one object, then we will use the singleton pattern. Now you may ask like, why should we have only one object of a class? Let's take for example, the printer driver. If you allow multiple objects of the printer driver created, what's going to happen is, imagine you click on file print over here at PowerPoint, and then you open up Word and then click on file print on Word. If an object of printer is created every time we click on file print, What's going to happen is all these printer objects are going to try and get hold of the printer. So there may be a lock or what's going to happen is in one page, the very first part is going to be PowerPoint and the next part is going to be Word. So to avoid these kind of confusions, certain classes like the logger, printer, we want only one object of the class to be created. So how do we solve that? In Eclipse, let us create a new Java project give it a name and click on finish. And in the source folder, let us create a new package. So here we have created a package called com.singleton. Now let us create a class called logger. And let us also create another class called test logger. And let this test logger have the public static void main method. Now you know that if you have a class, you can create multiple objects of this class. So here you can see that we have created two objects of this logger class. But the singleton pattern says we should be able to create only one object of that class. So how do we do that? You know that whenever an object is created, by default, the constructor is called. So this class called logger, even though you are not able to see it to the naked eye, has a method, has a constructor right here. The constructor is a method that has the same name as the class name. And by default, even though you cannot see it, every class has a default no arguments constructor. So there is some code like this, even though you cannot see it. Whenever you create an object, it will execute this particular method and create the object of logger. So without the constructor, you cannot create objects of a class. So all we have to do is right here in the constructor, make it private. So once you make a particular method private, that means it is not accessible outside of this particular class. So here you can see that it is no longer able to create logger objects because it is not able to access the constructor, the constructor method. But then this doesn't solve the problem. The problem is we should still be able to create one object and we have to reuse the same object again and again. So how do we create that one object? What design pattern says is, Create a logger instance right here within the logger class. 
So what we are doing here is we are creating a private logger, logger instance. And then over here, we are going to write a get instance method. This method can be any name. I'm just going to call it get instance. What this get instance method is going to do is it's going to check if there is an object of logger right here assigned to this. If it is not assigned to it, then let us create a new logger object and return it. The syntax is something like this. If this particular logger instance is null, then create a new logger object and assign it to this logger. So if this is null, create a new logger object and assign it to this logger. And then return this logger object. Of course, if a method returns some object, we have to specify what it returns. So it's going to return a logger object right here. The return type is mentioned right here. So we have a get instance method which checks if this is null. And if this is null, it will create a new logger object, assign it to it and return it. If it is not null, it will simply return that logger object. But if you go back, we cannot call that get instance method. The reason why we cannot call a get instance method is without creating objects, you cannot call the methods in the class. You need an object of a class to call the methods of that particular class. So how do we call this method called get instance without creating an object? There is another way. If you remember the concept of static, static is not one per object, it is one per class. So if you specify that the get instance method is static, then we no longer need to create objects of a class to call this method. Static also comes with another rule. Static says static methods can only call other static methods or data. So here it says, so here it complains. It says like, hey, static methods can only call other static methods or data. You're trying to call this logger and this is not static. So to solve it, we simply make this also static. So now if you go back to test logger, you no longer need objects to call the logger.get instance because it is a static method. We can simply say logger.get instance. We can call that method using the class name because it is a static method. And we can call it multiple times. The very first time you call get instance, what's going to happen is it's going to come here. It is going to check if this logger is equal to null. Of course, we did not assign anything right here, any values over here. It is so, so it is going to be null. So you're going to create a new logger object and assign it to it and return this logger object. But the next time you call that same method, it's going to come here and see, hey, is this null? No. We just created it. We have assigned this logger to a new logger object. So it will skip this particular code and return the logger object. So the same object is going to be returned again and again. How can we prove it? We are going to print the hash code of both the objects. So let's run this. Run Java application. So by printing the hash code, you can see that both the hash codes are the same, thereby proving that these are the same objects. If you try to print the hash code of some other class, you will see that two objects, if they are different, they will have different hash codes. For example, let us try to create objects of test logger right here and print out the hash codes. So here you can see that we have created two new objects of this class test logger using the constructor. Even though you cannot see the constructor, there is by default a no arguments constructor. And if you try to print the hash code of these two objects, it's going to be different. I have some print statements to differentiate the two codes. Let's run this. So here you can see that the singleton class, both the objects have the same hash code but for the test logger, since the objects are different, you're going to have different hash codes. 
So what is a singleton pattern? Singleton pattern ensures that only one object of a class is created. How do we achieve that? We make the constructor of the particular class private. We create a get instance method. The get instance method will check if an instance of this particular class, a logger class already exists. If it does not exist, it will create a new logger object, assign it and return it. If it already exists, it will simply return that same object again and again. We make this get instance method static so that we can call the get instance method without creating objects of this class. So this is the singleton pattern. It ensures that only one object of a class is created. Now, before we move on, let us look at some basic concepts of object oriented programming you should know. So I have a package here called basic concepts and we have here a class called A and then we have a class called B which extends A and then we have a test class with the main method. Now you know that you can create objects of A like this and objects of B like this. But can we also create objects like this? Yes, you can. You can create objects like A object equal to new B. That is superclass object equal to new subclass. Superclass object equal to new subclass. But is the reverse true? No, this is not possible. You cannot say subclass object equal to new superclass. Now, you know that here you are creating an A object. Here you are creating a B object. But is this an A object or a B object? To answer that question, let's look at this line integer x equal to 10. Now, what is the value of x? The value of x is 10. Why is it 10? Because the right hand side says it is 10. So whatever is on the right hand side determines the value of this particular variable. Same way, when we say object equal to new b, whatever is on the right hand side determines the value of this particular object. So that means this object is a B object and not an A object. Whatever is on the left hand side determines the property of this particular variable. That means it can accept any integer values. It can accept any integer values. Same way this object has the properties of A. What do we mean by that properties of A but it is a object of B? Let's look into it. Now imagine this particular class A has a method A. And this method A prints out like class A M A. And this class B has a method B. And this class B has a method B which prints out class B M B stands for method B. Now you know that A objects can only call methods in A. It is a super class. You can see that it can only call methods in A. This B object, since B inherits from A, can call methods of A and B. You can see that it can call both method A and B. So this is easy. But here let's come to this. When we say object dot, you can see that it can only call methods of A. Now you may be wondering like, wait, wait, you said that this is a B object. If this is a B object, it should be able to call both method A and B. Yes, that is correct. But I also said that since X has a property of an integer, same way object has a properties of A, it can only access the properties defined in A. That means it can call method A, which is there in class B. Since B extends A, it will also have method A. So it is calling the method A available in class B. Now you may be wondering like, how can you prove it? Because if you run this, it's going to say AMA. Now to prove that this is a B object and not an A object, let's do this. We will override this method A of class A right here. 
in class B. So what we have done is the method A of class A has been overridden in class B and method A here will print out BMA and method A in class A will print out AMA. Now when we run this, if this is an A object, it should call the method A in class A, just like over here. But since this is a B object, it will call the method A in class B, the overridden method. So here you can see that it is calling the class B's method A. This proves that this is a B object. But if you notice, even though it is a B object, it cannot access method B. The reason is the properties of A does not allow it to access B methods. Unless and until you have a method B right here, only then it will recognize it and it will call the methods B in class B. This class A actually need not be a class. It can also be an interface. So here we have converted a class A into interface A and then we have made this like an abstract method, an empty method. And here we are going to say implements. And here you cannot create objects of an interface. So we have to comment this out. And so here you can see the same thing holds. You can say either A is an interface or a class, it doesn't matter. You are saying interface A object equal to new B. You cannot create objects of an interface. So that itself should prove that this is not an A object. It is it has the values of B, but it has the properties of A. So here you can see that you cannot call method B unless the interface also defines a property called B. So by defining a property called B here, it is adding that capability. Once you have it right here, you can go call it over here. It will call the method B of class B because this is a B object. Next, imagine we have a class called employee with these properties or fields or data, however you want to call them. Imagine this class has employee ID, name, salary, grade and company. Now, when you have a class with properties, how do you decide which properties to set using a constructor and which properties to use the setter methods? If you can imagine the class as a table, for example, we have this employee table and the employee table has an employee ID, name, salary, grade and company. We were able to translate this table into a class. The table name becomes the class name. The column names like employee ID, name, salary become the field names. Now, when you enter data, that is every record right here, you will have to decide to create a record what are the absolute minimum values that are required to create a record? Now, if you take a look at this particular class, it has no constructor. That means we can go to test employee and create an object of employee without giving any values. What we are doing is we are creating a record without giving any values because every record can be assumed as an object. If we have a table, would we create a record without giving any values? We will decide, hey, to create a record right here in the table, at the minimum, we need some values. Like for example, hey, at least I need the employee ID and employee name. Salary may change later on, grade may change later on, but at the minimum, to create a record, I need the employee ID and employee name. So those requirements should go in the constructor. What are the minimum number of values or amount of values that are required to create a record? So if you go back to Eclipse, right here we have decided to create an employee record, we should have the employee ID and employee name. So those goes in the constructor. This dot employee ID. This employee ID is equal to this employee ID and this employee name, that particular records employee name is whatever is being supplied right here. So now what we are saying is prevent objects of employee 
being created. That means prevent records of employee being created without supplying the employee ID and employee name. Now, if you go back, it will not let you create objects without giving you the absolute minimum values of employee ID and name. So here you can see that using the constructor, we are preventing a record of employee being created without specifying the minimum required values of employee ID and employee name. So this is the use of constructor. A constructor is used to specify the minimum required value for creating a record or an object. When would you hard code the value? If you feel like every employee in this particular table is going to have the same company, the value is not going to change. In those cases, you can hard code the value. Hey, whenever I create a record or an object, by default, let it be some company name. So every object or every record should have the company name as IBM. So when would you use setters? So let's look at this table. If you feel a value can change frequently, hey, the salary will keep changing frequently. The grade is also going to change frequently. The person may get a promotion or you feel like I will not know the values when I create the record. Maybe it will be decided later. So if you feel that there are certain values in this particular table that I need not set while creating a record because they may change frequently or I may not know the values, they are not important values. Those can be in setter methods. So I'm going to right click on salary, generate getters and setters. And same thing for grade. Imagine your class file as a table. Imagine like, would we create a record with no values? It makes no sense. So what are the absolute minimum values that are required? In this case, employee ID and employee name, put them in a constructor. Salary and grade can keep changing or they are not absolutely required values. We can always enter them later, put them in setters. And if it's going to be the same value, then hard code that particular value. Now let's imagine we have an interface called email and this interface has a method called send email. And in the employee class, we're going to have a reference to that interface email. So we are creating an instance of this email, but then we haven't created an email object because you cannot create objects of an interface. Now over here, I'm going to write a notify employee method. And in this notify employee method, I'm going to call the email objects send email method. Now right here in the test employee, you will notice that I can call object one dot notify employee method. There will not be any compile error, but I haven't instantiated this particular interface email object. I have simply declared it as email email and I'm calling the methods. But if you run this, what's going to happen is this notify employee is going to call email dot sent employee, but there is no implementation for this interface. So it's going to blow up. So when you run this, you can see that it has a null pointer exception. The reason it's throwing a null pointer exception is it's going to say like, Hey, it compiled well, but this email has not been implemented. There is no implementation. You haven't set what this email is. So this is another great candidate for the constructor. So whenever you have an instance of email, you know that people are going to use them in the methods, but there is a risk that people may create objects of employee and try to call the methods without making sure that this particular email has been set. So what we can do is we can put that in the constructor and this will make sure that without setting this email to some implementation, we cannot create an object of this employee class. So we're going to receive an email object an implementation of email and we are going to set this email instance right here. Of course, now we need an implementation of email. 
you can have multiple implementations for an interface so let's create two implementation one called outlook and one called web service so the web service email implements email and the send email of the web service email is going to print out web service email and the outlook email which implements email the send email of outlook email is going to print out outlook email so here you can see that you can no longer create objects of employee because of the risk that people may call methods of that object without setting that email and it will create a runtime exception so here we have to send one of the implementations so we are going to say the super class object equal to new subclass that we learned the subclass of this interface email is outlook email so this is going to be an outlook email object because it's on the right hand side super class object equal to new subclass and we are sending to the employee the employee class requires an email object so the outlook email object will come in and set itself here so when you call email dot send email it will call the outlook email send email method and over here i'm going to reuse the same email instance now it's going to be assigned to the web service email so we are creating a new web service email object and assigning it to the email instance right here and we are sending in the web service email to this particular object and we are going to call notify employee for this object too so what's going to happen is this make sure you save your classes i was getting an error so what's going to happen is we are going to create an object make sure that the employee id name and the email also is set so when object one calls notify employee it's going to call the outlook email send email so it's going to print out outlook email and when object 2 calls notify employee it's going to call the web service email because object 2 has used web service email so web service email send email is going to be called now you can see the printout right here so when you have these kind of instances of an interface and you're going to make use of them in the methods in your code then this is another great candidate to be put in a constructor because you're running the risk of a runtime exception. People may create objects of your particular class or you may yourself create objects of a class and forget to set this particular email instance and you may be calling them right here. There is a risk that it will blow up at runtime. So now you have learned when to use a constructor, when to use a setter methods and when to hard code the values. Now let us look at another basic concept. It will help us understand all these design patterns that are coming up. Now imagine we have a class called contact with a name and we have a work contact that is work extends contact which has an email address and a friend extends contact which has the phone number. So a friend will have name and phone number, the work will have name and email address. All of them are public. Now in test contact, we can create two contacts. We can create a friend object, say friend contact one equal to new friend and work contact two equal to new work. And we can give for the friend contact the name and phone number and for the work contact the name and email address. Now we know that while creating objects, we can create objects using super class object equal to new subclass. So we can do something like this. So instead of saying friend contact, we can say the super class is contact, contact, contact one equal to new friend and contact, contact two equal to new work. We can do that. But you can see that immediately there is an issue. It says, well, I cannot access the phone number. Of course, that is correct. When we say integer x equal to 10, the right hand side determines the value. The left hand side is the restriction. Same way, even though this contact is a friend object, right hand side determines the value, it cannot accept the phone number because of the restriction. The contact only has access to name. So how can we overcome this? We can do something called as casting. What we can do is, 
Since we know that this is a friend object, we can say let's cast it as a friend. And then we'll put parenthesis for the entire thing. So this contact object is casted as a friend and this whole thing will now have access to the phone number. You can put a dot right here and see that it will have phone number. The same thing happens for this one too. You can cast it. You can cast this contact to as a work contact so that you will be able to access the email property. So this is the use of casting. The second point I want to talk about is, let us print the details using some two string methods. For example, let this work class and friend class have some two string methods. So here we have programmed the two string method, which basically returns the work name and name and email address right here. And the same way for the friend, the two string will return the name and phone number. You know the two string is the method that is called by default whenever you print an object. So in the test contact, let us print this object. I'm going to say, let's print out contact one and let's print out contact two. Now when we run this particular program, contact one, since it is a friend object, it will call the two string of friend, it will print out friend name and phone number and contact two, since it is a work object, will print out work name and email address. It will have access to the name because work extends contact. So let's run this. You can see that the friend name and work name and email address are being printed right here. Now imagine, instead of having a two string for every class, I want to put the two string in the contact class. So let me copy this, comment this one out, comment the two string of friend two, and I want to paste it right here. But now we have a problem. How will I access the email address and how will I access the phone number? Now what we can do is we can use something called as reflection. When contact one object, when this particular object now calls two string, it will call this particular two string because this is the only one that is available. It may be a friend contact or a work contact It's going to call this two string. So that particular object is going to call this two string. So when contact one calls two string, we can check right here if this, this represents that contact object, whichever contact object is calling it, is an instance of friend. If this is an instance of work, do something else. We can do the casting and all those things right here. So the final two string method will look something like this. So you can see that we are checking when this contact one calls the two string method, if it is an instance of friend, in this case, it will be an instance of friend, contact one is an instance of friend. It will say like, okay, let us go and print out friend name, let us print out the name over here. And for the phone number, let us convert, let us cast the this keyword, that is the contact object into a friend and then access the phone number. Same way for the next line, when the contact two, which is of type work, calls the two string method, it will not be an instance of friend, but it will be an instance of work. And so it will print out the work name and then it will cast that particular contact object into work and it will access the email address and then it will return it. Now when we run this particular program, you will see the same answers. So this is a bit of reflection and this is about casting. So these basic concepts, I just want to make sure you understand it before we move on to the other patterns. Next. Let us look at the factory pattern. Factory pattern says that if you want to create an object in your application, do not go around creating objects anywhere you want. Have a separate place to create those objects, a separate factory class or a folder where you will create, where you will store all the business logic for creating objects. Just like a shoe factory manufactures shoes and a car factory creates cars, you will have a separate place to create your objects based on some kind of an input parameter. What do we mean by that? Let's take a look. I'm going to create a new package. Now imagine we want to create a program to divide two numbers. What we would do without using patterns? We may create a class like say divide. Here we may have a method like say calculate. So here we have a divide class with the calculate method which takes in two numbers and it will print out the answer right here. In our project, let's say a test class with the main method, we will input two numbers, create an object of divide, and then we'll call that method. So here in the main method, we will use the scanner object to input two numbers. 
So we are creating a new scanner object. We are printing out enter first number and whatever they enter we will store it in double number one and the second number in double number two. We will create an object of divide and we will call the calculate method in the object divide and pass in the two numbers. So for the first number let me enter 2.5 second number I'll enter like say 1.5 and this is the answer that is being printed. So if you do not use design patterns this is how we would go about solving this problem. But what does factory pattern advise? One of the basic rules of design patterns is you should always program to an interface. What do we mean by this? What design pattern says is never have classes just like that. If you want to create a class make sure that that class implements some interface. Always create an interface and then write the class to implement the interface. There is a lot of flexibility in doing so. So let's do that. Let's create an interface called calculate with the calculate method. So we have an interface called calculate and we are going to create the calculate method right here. So this interface has a calculate method which takes in two numbers number one and number two. And we'll make the divide method implement that interface calculate. The advantage of programming to an interface is it makes the program, it makes the application flexible. Now we can have various implementations of those interface. So let us create implementations like say add and subtract which all will implement the calculate interface. Let me change the code to a plus b is a plus b and in subtract I will make it subtract over here. So now we have one interface called calculate and we have multiple implementations of that particular calculate interface and add implementation which adds the numbers, divide implementation which divides the numbers and subtract implementation which subtracts the numbers. Now what we will do is we will create a separate factory class which will take in some kind of an input parameter which will say like what kind of object you need and based on that input parameter it will create that object and return that object for us. So let's create a class called calculate factory and let's create a method like say get calculation. This method called get calculation will have to receive some kind of uh, input parameter saying that what object do you need and if that object in turn needs some kind of an input parameter we need to get those things too. In this case we will simply request hey what type of object do you need. So we will input a string type. Once we get the input of string type we have to return based on the request either an add object or a subtract object or a divide object. So what should be the return type of this method? If you remember this concept that you can create superclass object equal to new subclass. The superclass can be an interface or an abstract class or just a regular superclass. So that means when we create an instance of this superclass object you can plug in any subclass and this object will be that of the subclass. Add object which implements calculate and subtract object all of them are of type calculate. So when you create a calculate instance you can plug in either an add object or a subtract object or a divide object. So here we will return calculate. So that by you can fit in either the add, subtract or divide because superclass can take in any one of those subclasses. Let us create a calculate object right here and we'll keep it null for now and then we'll do some kind of check. Okay, what type of request is being sent? If type dot to lowercase dot equals add, create a new add object and assign it to this object. That is why we saw the concept of superclass object equal to new subclass. And now here we will return this object. So based on some kind of an input criteria, we are going to create add object or subtract object or divide object and assign it to this. So this value will either be add or subtract or divide and that is being passed right here. So object creation has been restricted to one class. What type of object to create based on certain parameters. So in the test class instead of creating a divide object we will create a calculate factory object and this calculate factory object is going to call the get calculation method 
and we have to give some kind of an input so we will use the scanner so whatever you type in the console will be sent to the get calculation method the get calculation will receive that particular input and based on the input it will create the object either add or subtract or divide and it will return that particular object right here so we have to receive a calculate object let's rename this to factory and we will say calculate object equal to factory dot get calculation i just renamed this to factory for the simple reason is it's much more readable so now we have a calculate object equal to factory dot get calculation so this factory will get you either an add object or a subtract object or a divide object and all of them will go into the super class object that is the interface calculate now when we say this calculate object dot calculate what's going to happen is because the value of this object is determined with what is there on the right hand side if it is add it will call the add methods calculate if it is subtract it will call the subtract methods calculate and so on so now let's run this program i forgot to ask them what type of object they require so here we have entered a system.out.print line enter calculation needed add subtract or divide and also right here instead of saying input.next line i have changed it to input.next because when you say input.next line it's going to try to read the entire line and it will result in an exception so change it to input.next now let's run this first number eight second number say three calculation needed add and here you will see the answer a plus b is 11. So here you can see the advantage of programming to an interface. When you program to an interface, you can plug in any kind of object if you want. You can plug in any kind of object and you can reuse that object again and again. And the factory pattern advises if you want to create your object, have a separate factory class which will take in the requirements that you need. It will take in what type of object you want and if that object needs some kind of a requirements. Based on that, it will create the object and send it to you. The advantage of having the factory pattern is you have one place in your project where you create these objects. So if ever there is a requirement like if you want to change the way the object is being created, you only have to do it in one place, how the object is created. Maybe you want to say like the only way an add object is created is by using some kind of a constructor. So all those changes can take place in one place. The factory pattern is the most commonly used pattern in any application. So going forward in all your applications, remember to always program to an interface. And the second thing is if you want to create objects, make sure you have a separate folder a separate package with those classes whose sole duty will be like to create those objects that you want in your application and send those objects to you do not go around creating objects like say hey create an add object by saying add object equal to new add no you send the request to some other class let it create the object and it will return that object and then you can make use of the object next let us look at the concept of template method pattern Template method pattern states subclasses decide how to implement steps in an algorithm. Now let's see what it means. Subclasses decide how to implement steps in an algorithm. Imagine I have a class called Excel file and this class has three methods. One to read data from an Excel file, another to process data from an Excel file and the third one to save data to the database. So here you have a method called read data which prints out read data from an Excel file. So basically this method is going to have some kind of a code which reads data from Excel file. So instead of the code, I have this placeholder right here. The process data method is going to print out process data from Excel file. And the save data method is going to save the data to the database. Now I'm going to create a test method to test these three methods with the public static void main. So we are creating an object of Excel file and it's going to call the read data method, process data method, and save data method. So let's run this. So you have the printout read data from Excel file, process data from Excel file, and save data to the database. So imagine I have another program very similar to this, 
which reads data from a text file, processes data from the text file, and saves data to the database. So let's call it text file system. I'm going to copy these three methods, paste it there, and just change these words. So read data from text file, process data from text file, and save data to the database. Now let's test this one out. So instead of Excel file, it's going to be text file. I want to create another object called object2. It's going to be text file object, and all these are going to be object2. So when I run this particular program, you can see that here it's going to read from a text file, process data from text file, save data to the database. Now, if we were to publish these classes to some other programmer, what's going to happen is the other person may call these methods in the wrong order. They may call the process data before calling the read data, or they may call the save data and then they may call the read data. So imagine we want to call these methods in a particular order. We want to maintain this order like first call read data and then the process data and then the save data. Because for our program, imagine that's the correct order. So how can we force that? Maybe we can create a method which calls these three methods in that particular order and then we can simply call that particular method over here. Something like this. So imagine I create a new method called read process and save data. And in this we are going to call these three methods in the correct order. So we now have a new method which calls these three methods in the correct order. So there won't be any kind of a confusion if I'm going to hand over this particular file to some other programmer, there won't be any confusion about which method has to be called first and then which second and so on. We can do the same thing for the text file. I'm going to copy this and paste it in the text file. So it will call the read, process and save data. And over here, instead of calling these methods one after another, let me comment this. We are simply going to call read process and save data method and the same thing over here too. When we run this, there shouldn't be any difference. You can see that it calls those three methods, but now we are calling it in certain order. So now we have two classes which do two different things. One reads data, processes data and saves data from Excel files and another does the same thing for text files. But if you look at these two classes, this read process and save data has the same code across both the class files. Same way, the save data has the same code. Imagine they have the same code across both these class files. Only the read data and process data, the code would be different. So the read data of text file will basically have code to read data from a text file, whereas the read data for Excel file will have code to read data from an Excel file. So according to object-oriented programming, Java, the most efficient way, if you have methods, if you have the same methods across different class files, so the efficient way to do that is to put it in a superclass, in a base class. If you put it in a superclass, then those methods can be shared across different class files. So let's create a superclass. I'm going to create a new class and let's call it, say, data processor or something. This data processor class is going to have the common methods in both the Excel file and text file. So what are the common methods in Excel file and text file? This read, process, and save data is a common method. So I'm going to cut this out, paste it right here. And the save data method is also going to be common. So imagine like they have the same code to save the data into the database. I'm going to cut this out and save it right here. So now that we have it over there, I'm going to delete it from the text file too. Let me delete it from the text file. So we now have a class called data processor, which has the common methods of both the Excel and text file. Of course, we have to now make sure that the Excel file inherits or extends the data processor so that we can still have those methods right here. So the text file extends data processor and Excel file extends data processor. So when we go back to the test template method, you can see that there is no difference. So the Excel file extends data processor and text file extends data processor. So now they have those two methods which we removed from here. But if you look at the data processor class right now, it is having some issues. What are the issues? 
it is saying it is not able to recognize the read data and process data, which is correct. The subclasses know of the methods in the superclass. Excel file knows about those methods in the superclass. Text file knows about methods in the superclass. But the superclass will have no idea about the methods in the subclass. Here you have a method calling read data, but there is no way for this class to know about the read data method in the subclasses. So how do you solve an issue like this? If you think back to object-oriented programming, your Java basics, how can we solve this problem? If you have guessed abstract methods, you are correct. Because the superclass has no idea about the subclass methods, we can create what we called as placeholder, an empty method, an abstract method right here just to compile this particular class. So what we can do is we can write a method called public void read data and then declare it as an abstract method. You can see that the error has gone away over here. Of course, this one is complaining now because we have that rule that you can only have abstract methods in abstract classes. So all you have to do is declare this as abstract. Now we can do the same thing for process data. So now you can see that this class compiles. Previously it was not compiling because read data and process data was not visible in this class because the super class has no idea about the subclass methods. So what we did is we created some kind of a placeholders. Placeholders are nothing but we are telling this particular data processor, hey, I'm going to create an empty method called read data and process data and I'm going to define it later on in the subclass because there are going to be multiple different types of implementations to it, maybe. And we are simply going to call this class as abstract because of the rule that abstract methods can only be in abstract classes. This is just to prevent people from creating objects of this class. So now if we go back to this test template method, everything will work the same. When you create an object of Excel file, it will have the superclass method data processor. It will have this method. It will call this read process and save data. But when it triggers the read data, what's going to happen is it's going to call the read data of Excel. It's going to call the read data of Excel file because, because basically you're calling this method in the Excel file. You're calling this method in the Excel file because you're creating an object of Excel file. When we run this program, you'll see that there is no difference. First, you're creating an object of Excel file. You're calling the read process and save data method in the Excel file, which then calls the read data, process data and save data of Excel file. The save data is right here because it's going to have the same code. Now let's look back at the definition. A template method pattern, subclasses decide how to implement steps in an algorithm. We now have an algorithm. The algorithm states these are the steps. First, you have to read data. Second, you have to process data and third, you have to save data. The common methods are there in the superclass, but the subclasses decide how to implement these steps in the algorithm. The read data is going to be implemented differently in Excel as well as in text. So the subclasses decide how to implement the steps in an algorithm. This is the example of the template method pattern. This is also a great example for abstract classes. You now know why exactly we use abstract method and abstract classes. You can see the evolution of them. You can also use the principle of superclass object equal to subclass. Instead of saying Excel object, you can say data processor object equal to new Excel file. And then you can reuse the same object. We can say object is now assigned to text file. And now when we call the same read process and save method, it's going to call the text files read process and the common save data methods. When we run this, you can see that there is no difference over here. So this is the template method pattern where the subclasses implement the steps in the algorithm.